the, this topic as a special request. We had the Fayyani, and it came to my mind that Abuna Karolus has the Fayyani is, is expert in this expert area. <laughs> I'm here to learn from what's Thank you. Thank you, Abuna, for yani, uh, making the time. Yeah, come on. We know it's a, it's a busy time, busy season, Yanni. Uh, thank you, Bruno, for making the time and being with us to talk to, to, to us about this very important Yanni uh, talk. Because uh, we, we're going into kind of studying the books of the Bible. Okay. So uh, someone someone suggested Keda and Nahna Taib Nahud al prophecies baa alashan baa preparation okay. for the Passion Week. Uh, Ashan al Passion Week. For Allah, it's a good it's a good uh, good idea. يعني والشخص ده ما كانش هيحضر بس نشكر ربنا يعني ربنا ستر عليه ان هو موجود. So please join me in welcoming the whole Thank you, Abi. In the name of the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Don't deserve what Abuna said. And we learn, we all learn from Abuna. But يعني it's out of his love and humility. He always gives me kind of positive words. So God willing, today we're gonna talk about. Uh, Christ being the subject of the scriptures and the Bible. A lot of times we, when we start reading the Old Testament, we find the Old Testament hard. I can't really relate to the Old Testament and I find the Old Testament, I, when people want to, uh, when they tell them to read the Bible, all they want to read the New Testament. You know somebody who usually people come in confession, what, what can you read, what can you read? Only uh, the Pauline is difficult and the uh, Revelation, I don't understand it. And the Old Testament is hard, so, it, so what's remaining? The four Gospels, right? Over and over and over. But God willing today, and you know, through Abuna's blessings and prayers, we're going to talk about the Old Testament, and we're going to look at some of the prophecies, and we're going to focus on some of the, uh, and in the end of the talk, about the prophecies about the suffering of our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. Okay, first we need to remember to understand the Bible. We need to understand that Jesus Christ is the center of the scriptures and key to understanding the Old Testament. When we see the only Bible study that Christ has done, uh, who can tell me, we see this verse here, when the Lord wanted to do Bible study, he said in beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Where do we see that verse? Where do we see that when, the, when our Lord wanted to talk about himself, he started at, and when he says, beginning at Moses, the word Moses here, what does Moses refer to? The Old Testament used to be called Moses and the prophets. Moses, meaning the five books of Moses, right? Which are Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Numbers, right? The five books of Moses. All the prophets, meaning all the prophecies, were about our Lord Jesus Christ, as we're going to see. So where, where do we see that verse? Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures concerning the things concerning himself. Anyone knows? Where do we see that verse? in? Urban. <laughs> <laughs> I, all, I, I, always, I remember from this meeting, Abuna Damon gives Urban, and we're trying to copy Abuna do, doing the same. Yes, Nancy. Book of Exodus. Okay. No, this is our Lord. Our Lord doing Bible study. New Testament. Yes. Two disciples of? Amen. was very good. So, exactly. And this is in Luke 24. <laughs> So our Lord Jesus Christ, here very, very, he very clear, he wants us to read the Old Testament, seeing him in the Old Testament. This is very important. I'm not sure if you guys know this guy. This guy is called Marcion, and he was in the second century, and he denied the Old Testament. He said, why do we need the Old Testament? Because Christ come, and Christ fulfilled the law. Christ was crucified. We as Christians should only focus on the New Testament, and he kind of wanted to put the Old Testament aside. But of course, this is we, this is, does not go with our understanding. Because we see that the Lord quoted the Old Testament many times. Our Lord during, during his ministry quoted the Old Testament many, many times. So we cannot deny the Old Testament. We cannot say the Old Testament we don't need anymore. If Christ in his ministry quoted the Old Testament a few times or multiple times, even St. Paul, you know, when you look at the book of Hebrews, he quoted the Old Testament numerous times. Because the Old Testament was preparing us for the coming of Christ. So we call the mystery of Christ, always remember this, the mystery of Christ is not new, but was hidden in the Old Testament. And we find 
يعني many verses like this is the verse in one of the epistles the mystery which was, has been hidden from ages and from generations now has been revealed to his saints so always remember so I want you all to remember from here our Lord Jesus Christ at the center and the goal of the scriptures this is the first thing we need to remember and we need to remember that the mystery of Christ his incarnation his crucifixion his resurrection his ascension all that was hidden in the Old Testament so it's not new so the mystery of Christ was not, is not new, but was hidden in the Old Testament. Okay, when we look at the Bible, all, all the church fathers, when they interpreted the scriptures of the word of God, all the fathers read the scripture through the perspective of Christ's incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, and second coming. Okay, all the fathers, when they interpret the scriptures, the Old Testament, they look at, the, the, uh, it's all about Christ. Okay, he is the center of the, the word of God. Every part in the Old Testament, reveals the coming of Jesus and through the words and establish it by examples, events, and persons. Who can give me an example of a person that was a type of Christ? Who can give me an example from the Old Testament? Somebody who was an example of Christ. Holy Thursday is approaching very soon, a week today. Isaac, Isaac right? Isaac, this is, a, this is maybe the easy one, that in the same way that Isaac carried the, 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 the wood, to be sacrificed, he came back alive. How about Daniel? Daniel, again, you know, it's great when, and Daniel as an example, when you look how was Daniel was thrown in lines then, and he was, they found no fault in him. So, so we, the fathers look at Daniel, being an example of Christ, he was in the tomb. And all night long, the king wanted, went early to check on him, in the same way that the Marys came to check on Christ. And he found him alive, right? So again, we see many examples of the Old Testament, a lot of, again, Melchizedek, a lot of examples, but Daniel was one of, the, one, I, one of my favorites because it's the story of Daniel, him being thrown in the lion's, in the lion's den, and the king didn't want to throw him in the lion's den, and he said, I found no fault. The only fault they found in him concerning his God. Like Christ, when they said there is no fault in him, what can I do? So when we look at the king and Pilate, we find a lot of resemblance how Daniel exactly was showing how Christ David, which we're going to do in a bit, uh, a saint called Saint Irenaeus of said, all Old Testament, especially the book of Psalms, must be Christologically understood. So we need to have this Christology or under, put, putting Christ at the center of the scriptures. Okay, this is just a quick introduction. And then we're going to look at two passages which focus much on the suffering of Christ. Okay. <clears throat> And again, as, as you said, Marina, Christ is the center. And he said, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scripture, the things concerning himself. And this is what the second day after the resurrection, right? The Monday after the resurrection. So the best way to, um, to remember the Bible, Christ being the subject of the Bible, think the Old Testament, sh so it should be Testament, sorry. The Old Testament, the message, his coming. The Gospels, his here. The Acts and the letters proclaim him. Book of Revelation is his coming again. Okay, so this is, if we want to summarize the whole Bible, we say the Old Testament is saying, it's, it has a spelling mistake, so I guess, uh, let me fix it first. Okay, if you can take pictures. Oops. Okay, that, uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So, okay, now it's okay. Old Testament, his coming, Gospels, his here. Okay, now we can take picture. I'm comfortable now. Okay. <laughs> and the Acts proclaiming our Lord Jesus Christ, the message of the Gospel, and the book of Revelation is saying his coming again. So you see all around the scriptures, it is about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. How many prophecies? were fulfilled in Christ. In the Old Testament, how many prophecies? Which we're gonna do one by one today. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, how many prophecies? <laughs> how many prophecies? Who can take a guess? How many prophecies were fulfilled in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ? I know from a course it was thousands. Thousands? Okay, okay, okay. The number, okay. Uh, are you gonna believe her? I'm just kidding. <laughs> what do you think? How many prophecies were fulfilled in our Lord Christ? One. One prophecy. Okay. 
Well, he's, I mean, basic, the, the most important one, which is that he's coming as a, as a Messiah. Okay, but I'm talking specific prophecies yeah, and concerning his life. Oh, of course, the crucifixion, the, you know, the pain, everything. How many were? Oh. <laughs> okay, Yali, just Yali, to keep it short, there are about 353 wow. prophecies fulfilled in our Lord Jesus Christ. Starting with tomorrow, the feast of. <laughs> Starting with, with the feast of tomorrow, the feast of Annunciation, when the angel came. And it says, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his, call his name Emmanuel. And it's, you see this, actually, to, this is tomorrow's gospel. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God, city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, to the house of, of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. So about him being born out of a virgin, from a virgin, this was written by Isaiah. Isaiah lived how many years before Christ? Thousands further? <laughs> how, many, how many years around? 800 years, yes. 800 years, and Isaiah, yani, Isaiah is one of, yani, they call Isaiah the fifth evangelist. Because what we're going to see in a bit, we're going to talk about Isaiah 50. 50 came the, the, the book of, uh, the chapter of suffering. 50? 53, yes, good. Okay. We see, when Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son, the book of Hosea. This is the flight of the Holy Family to Egypt. Of course, if we're going to go through all the, just giving you snippets of the prophecies, how they were written in years, but if we're going to go through the 300, uh, 300 prophecies, we have letters just tomorrow, Yanif. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't it only for that one, or the, Which one? There should be an altar the Lord in the midst of Egypt. Yes, yes. But, uh, this is about the visit of, of the Holy Family to Egypt. Yes, Isaiah 7, 14. Okay. Old Testament, Old Testament we see, again we're jumping quickly to the, the, behold your king is coming to you, he's just and having salvation, lowly riding on a donkey, colt full of a donkey, and here this is Palm Sunday of course, and then during the days, kings would never go riding a donkey. Yani what kind of king would go victorious? Yani it doesn't make any sense. But of course we know the fulfillment of this prophecy in the New Testament, the next day a great multitude cried out, Hosanna, the blessed he comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel and Jesus, when he found a young donkey, sat on it as it is written. Okay, so when we look at the prophecies, when they're written in the time they were written, people look at the prophecy and say, why would a king ride a donkey? It doesn't make any sense. But that was fulfilled in uh, our Lord's entry to Jerusalem. He was oppressed, and I think I'm going to leave these prophecies to the end because we're going to maybe focus uh, them in, in near the end. They pierce my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They look and stare at me. They divide my garments among them, and from my clothing they cast out lots. And in the New Testament, when, the, when they crucified our Lord, they divided his garments, casting lots that may be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophet. I'm going to skip this, and I'm going to, as we're going to be focusing on the sufferings in the end of the, of the talk. Okay, an example of David. We talked about Daniel briefly, but let's look at an example here of how David as a person was a type of Christ. How David was a type of Christ. Okay, so we saw prophecies, words were fulfilled in the life of Christ. Even certain individuals, you can talk about Daniel, you can talk about Joseph, you can talk about many of them, but for sake of time, we take an example, David. David was a shepherd from Bethlehem who was chosen by God to be king of Israel. Christ is the good shepherd, king of kings and from Bethlehem. Okay, so when we look in the life of David, we're gonna, we find a lot of parallels between him and our Lord. David was a mighty warrior king. Jesus was the mighty warrior king. Jesus faced uh, off against the enemy of the old, old church and defeated him with his own weapon. So David stood in, in front of the enemy of the Old Testament and he defeated him, right? And we see our Lord uh, defeated the ultimate enemy of the church and defeated him with his own weapon. If you guys remember, uh, when, do, when do we talk about this? When, where, when do we emphasize that we, we, we liken Christ to David? Something we do after the Good Friday, we read a psalm in Lil Tabogalamsis, right? Apocalypse night, Psalm 1, 151, right? We talk about how David was able 
to kill Goliath with his own weapon. How did Christ defeat the devil? That what was the, the, uh, the weapon of the devil against humanity? What was, what, what was the weapon that the devil had human, humanity subjected to? Death. Death, very good. And he conquered the devil by his own weapon. It's like, I'm going to conquer you by dying on the cross. <laughs> okay. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, David's mighty men were with him when he ate the shoe bread on the tabernacle. Jesus' mighty men were with him when he walked through the green fields, again, uh, representing the disciples. David had a betrayer uh, when his spot was uncovered, went and hanged himself. Jesus had a betrayer who, when he, his spot was uncovered, went and hanged himself. Again, sent by his father. Also, he was sent by his father. Yani many, many of uh, examples that we can see. Okay, for the, for the sake of time, I want to show you Christ in all the books in the Bible. There is a nice book called Christ in All the Books in the Scriptures. It's a very nice book. I think it's available as a PDF to look at Christ in every book in the Scriptures. Every book in the Bible has Christ in it. Right? So it's not only Christ in the Gospels. As we said, the Old Testament, the message is Christ is coming. The Gospels, he is here. The Acts proclaim him. Book of Revelations, he is coming again. So this is the summary of the Word of God. So quickly, I'm going to look at the old, every book in the Bible has Christ. Okay, I just did the Old Testament. And of course, the New Testament, I'm sure you can look it up. For the sake of time, Genesis he was called the seed of woman. So we see Christ saying to, the, to, the, to humanity, promising humanity, again, when, when, when the devil tempted, after the fall of man, he said, the, the offspring of woman will bruise your head, meaning uh, conquer the devil. Get the seed of woman. Exodus, the Passover lamb, and there's a lot of, you know, we're going to be discussing you know, Holy Thursday, all the prophecies, they refer to the, the Passover lamb, and that represents our Lord. Book of Leviticus is the high priest, Numbers, the cloud of, of on fire, Deuteronomy is the prophet in the city of refuge. So this is what we call the books of the law. Books of history as well we can see, and when you read the Bible in a, what we call in, in a Christological way, looking at Christ, stories becomes beautiful. And if, when you, the example of Book of Ruth, when you see Boaz representing, when, when you read the story of, of Ruth and you say, okay, so th this woman was treading uh, wheat and then somebody redeemed her, and you say, oh, well, there's nothing to do with my life. But when you read the book looking at, with the lens, looking at Christ, it becomes so beautiful. And then I can relate to the book. But if I just read about Ruth and her, 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 and her mother-in-law, say, well, well, why am I reading this book? But if I read with this understanding, where, where is Christ in this book? How can I grow my spiritual life? The Bible becomes so much different. Joshua is the captain of our salvation. Uh, judges, judge and law, lawgiver, Ruth, and we give the example. So for the sake of time, again, but reading in an, in, with the Christological background, the Bible becomes so much, much more deep and, uh, and enjoyable. And we can really kind of relate to the word of God. Okay, even in the book of poetry or uh, Job, Psalms and Proverbs, we see Job the bearer of suffering. And we have next Wednesday, we call it uh, Wednesday Arba Ayub, right? Because when we look at the suffering that Job went through, it is very relatable to Christ. So that's why we call the Wednesday of the Pascha is very relatable to Job. Because again, throughout the liturgical services, we relate what the people went in the Old Testament and the, again, to our, uh, sufferings of Christ. Psalms, he's our shepherd. Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, he's the wisdom of God. Song of songs, he's the lover and the bridegroom. Any of you guys read the Song of Songs before? No? You have? Okay. So. Again, if you read the book without, with no Christology or not looking at Christ being the bridegroom, you say, what, what kind of book is this, right? But it's very important to put a, see where in the scriptures we can see Christ being the, the bridegroom uh, of the church or of, of each of our souls. Major prophets, Isaiah, the suffering servant, and uh, we're going to focus a bit on Isaiah in the end. Jeremiah Lamentation, the weeping prophet, Ezekiel, the son of man, Daniel, the savior from the fiery furnace, even the minor prophets, each 
one of the minor prophets looked at Christ, he is there. So again, I, yani, when we read the word of God, it's very important to try to see where Christ is in this book. In Jonah, he's the forgiving God. In Micah, he's the messenger in Bethlehem. So again, every book in the scriptures uh, uh, refer to Christ in a certain way. Okay, this is just a quick introduction. Oh, it's not too quick, but quick introduction about the prophecies and how can we see Christ in the Old Testament. Now, for the, we need to talk about, because we're heading into Passion Week, we're going to talk about the prophecies that relate to the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. Where do we see this verse? Isaiah 53. I want you to remember two chapters in the Bible that kind of when you read the two, it kind of throws your mind away. How years before the coming of Christ, as if these prophets or the people of the Old Testament were under the cross watching. What are the two chapters I want you to know? Isaiah? Isaiah what? 53. And the other, other chapter is what? The book of Psalms. 22, great, 22. Remember guys, Psalm 23 is about the shepherd, 22 is about the savior. Okay, so uh, Psalm 23 is the most famous, most famous Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The one before right away, it's amazing how it talks about the details of the sufferings of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want you to remember these, these two, Psalm 22 and Isaiah 53. Okay, let's look at some prophecies and then we can focus, we can read the 53 and we'll let you go. Okay, so we see here the, the first prophecy or again, there is a lot of prophecy, but I picked like 10 for the sake of time again. Uh, the prophecy, the Passover lamb. If somebody can read for me the prophecy and then we'll look at the fulfillment. Who can read for us? You guys prepared by a fashion week is going to be a lot of readings. Yani <laughs> Yes, go ahead. Uh, then Moses summoned all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go at once and select the animals for your families and slaughter the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop, dip it in the blood of the base, in the basin, and put some of the blood on the top and on both sides of the door frame. None of you shall go out of the door of your house until morning. <coughs> when the Lord goes through the land to strike down the Egyptians, he will see the blood on the top and the sides of the door frame and will pass over that doorway. And you will not permit the destroyer to enter your houses and strike you down. Okay, so here, of course, St. Paul talks about Christ being in the Passover lamb. Let's try to relate what happened in this prophecy and how can we relate it to the blood of Christ. So here the destroyer, he, he told them, you, you, you again, you slaughter the Passover lamb and he take from the blood and put the blood where? A lot of times where? On the, on the top and the two sides. How about the ground? No, a drip. Oh, it's gonna drip. <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, unless you you do it well, yeah. But he did. If if it drips, that's a different story. But he did not tell them put the blood on the floor. He said you put it on top and right here. Why is that? Because the blood of Christ, blood because that represents the blood of Christ. So we cannot put the blood of Christ or the a symbol of blood of Christ on the, on the ground, right? And what does the blood do when when the destroyer? The destroyer here, referring to the angel of death, the destroyer, what did the destroyer do? He pass over, and what does he do? If he doesn't see a blood, he sorry, kills the firstborn. So what happens? The blood saves from death. You see the blood, you're allowed to live. In the same way, the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ is uh, what saved us from death. So the first prophecy, blood saves we see that the, 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 the same way that the blood of the Passover lamb saves from death, the blood of Christ saved us from death as well. Another example here, it says about prophecy, it must be eaten inside the house, take none of the meat outside the house, don't break any of the bones, right? And of course the Passover lamb, there were certain people who must only can eat the Passover. Anyone who is not from God's people, uncircumcised, cannot eat. Representing the circumcision represents the baptism. And anyone who's not baptized cannot partake of, a, of the body and blood of our Lord. Okay, and again, do not break any of any of its bones. And this was fulfilled in Christ when he was on the cross. Why did he want it to break their bones so they can die? 
what's the relationship between the bones and them dying on the cross? The teeth? Yeah, yes. Usually they break their bones so they don't have, they can't rise up and take a breath. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So again, so they wanted to kind of make that death happen quickly. So they broke, they wanted to break their legs so they can, they can die quickly. Not from the pain of, of, of but again, if not able to be, to suffocate. But Christ, when they came to Christ, as we all know, uh, uh, they came to Christ and already found him dead. When they came to Jesus, found him that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. These things happen that the scripture would be fulfilled. None of his bones would be broken. And again, this, when we talk about the Romans here, the Romans had no idea what was written in the law. The Romans had nothing to do with what was written in the law. But if, as if the prophecies were written saying this will happen in the future. Okay, so the, this is again very profound that we see that the prophecy is written in the, in the Old Testament and the Romans are carrying exactly what, what was prophesied. Forsaken, Psalm 22. And again, this psalm is very nice. Can I urge you, Messiah, during Pascha, if there's a long hymn that you're not really following, read Psalm 22 and read Isaiah 53. Okay. Uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? And we see in the, uh, yeah, in about the third hour, maybe this is a three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why, why have you forsaken me? Some say that when Christ screamed with a loud voice or cried with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, he was reminding the people standing of all the prophecies that were written in the psalm. Okay, so he's bringing to attention that all the prophecies are being fulfilled in my crucifixion. He would be scorned, again, the prophecy, Psalm 22, again, about the suffering. He, he trusts in the Lord. He say, let the Lord rescue him, let him deliver him, since he delights in him. And again, we see that this is exactly what they said to Christ. <clears throat> he saved others, but he cannot save himself. Is the king of heaven. Let him come down now from the cross, again, making fun of him. And will believe in him, he trusts in God, let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. So the prophecy is being exactly fulfilled. Psalm 22, we see the fulfillment of the, prof uh, of the prophecy. This is interesting, darkness at noon. And I'm not sure if you guys know, but uh, if you search online the, uh, the darkness at crucifixion, it cannot be described with, with any science or astrology. So the darkness, this happened in history. And I think St. Paul was preaching in, I think in Athens, and one of them, didn't, he, this is how he believed. When he told, told, told him about the, the, the darkness, he told him, how can you, you remember the darkness that happened on that day, on the specific day? And yes, for three hours. And he believed through this instant of the darkness on the cross. And they say it cannot be a solar, like I have a nice video, maybe we can show it in a, another day. But if we have time, maybe we can see it. So it talks about that for to have a solar eclipse during that time of the Passover or whatever, if it were to happen, it would be only maximum eight minutes. But if we have darkness for three hours, this is something is definitely wrong here. So the God of the universe is on the cross and we see darkness over the whole earth. And, Amos speaking about the days of God's wrath on his people, prophesies and says, on that day declares the Lord, I will make the sun go down at noon and darken the earth in broad daylight. This is exactly what happened on Good Friday. And that's how the church lives the event. When, 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 when we're reading Good Friday and say there were darkness, what does the deacon do or the deacons? They turn off the lights just to kind of see that this is again the fulfillment. The church wants us to live all the events that were prophesied and were fulfilled in our, our Lord and we live it in the church. Jesus bore God's wrath over human sin, was crucified from the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. Of course, you guys know the difference Taman, in hours when we say the third hour, or so sixth hour means noon, okay? There is a six, yani, there is a calculation. And because when we start the eve of the following day, so you come Sunday night, we start the eve of Monday. And you, a lot of times people, when they're, they come Monday night, like either way we're doing eve of Tuesday, right? So this is how the Pascha hour uh, work. What else? What other prophecies? His thirst, as we all know, Psalm 22. 
I want you to walk out from here. You're just remembering Psalm 22, Isaiah 53. His mouth dried up like a hot tread, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth and lay me in the dust of death. Later, knowing that everything has been finished or fulfilled, so that scripture will be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. And we know that they offered him uh, vinegar to drink. Okay. Pierced his hands and feet. Psalm 22 again. Dogs surround me. Heck of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet. When did we ever see David getting his hand and feet pierced? Never. But this is a prophecy about Christ. And again, the whole idea of the piercing of hand and feet, this is crucifixion. And the crucifixion is kind of a Roman practice, or actually started from the Persians and the, the Greeks and the Romans. So it was not really common for the Jewish people to crucify their, they would stone, they would do other stuff. But the crucifixion here, so David is prophesying about something that it's, doesn't make sense or not common to the Jewish uh, people at the time. Say there is piercing, they pierce, and David Messina, if he was really upset or down, they say they're stoning me with their words, but he's talked about piercing of the hand and feet. What are you talking about, David? Where are you getting the idea? Where, where is your mind taking you to talk about piercing of the hand and feet? He was referring to, to Christ, our Lord, right? Things happen to the scripture be fulfilled and none of his bones be broken. They will look on him, those who pierced him. And of course, they pierced his side as well. Yes. Question for you on David. Yes. Um, during that time, were people around him aware when he was writing these things that he was prophesying? Because otherwise it would seem to a layman's eyes that he's hallucinating, that he's out shepherding in the sun, that he's almost hallucinating, talking about someone piercing his hands and feet. Okay. Yeah, of course, yani at that time, maybe all the, the didn't make any sense to them. But Christ, when he cried on yani the beginning of the psalm, Christ wanted to remind them. Remi Again, in the Old Testament, how they used to memorize the psalms, they never, they never had numbers for the psalms. They used to give the first verse, and that's how people would recall the psalm. So Christ, by, by crying out, Eli, Eli, Lema Sabachthani, they would right away remember the psalm, and they would recite and say, oh, exactly what's been prophesied about, and what's happening in front of us on the cross. So at the time of David, I don't think people really understood, or maybe he, they said he's talking about his suffering, or or David missing going through a difficult time, or it's a psalm to express his uh, distress or whatever. Okay, this is quite interesting. Again, they divided my clothes among them and they cast lots for my, my garment. See, see here the accuracy? Okay, I want somebody to read the fulfillment. Any volunteers? The fulfillment of this prophecy? Go ahead, anyone? And the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, while the undergarment remains. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for the garment. So this is what the soldiers took. Okay, so again, again, we mentioned again, soldiers were Romans. They're not trying to fulfill prophecies, they're just doing whatever they wanted to do. But here, look at the accuracy here. So Jesus was wearing like an outer garment and an inner garment. They took the outside and they tore it into four pieces. And the four, or four pieces here referring what? The, all of the four shares, the four represents what usually? The four corners of the earth. So that means that the message of the gospel to go to the four corners of the earth. But the inside, they said, let's keep it whole. Meaning the gospel has to be one. The same gospel is shared to the four corners of the earth, right? So again, it's shared to the, uh, everywhere, but the message of the gospel is one. So this is again, the meaning. And we see this, I'm not sure if you guys know the story, when Arius started to deny the divinity of Christ, when Arius to, to uh, tried to deny the divinity of Christ, uh, Saint Peter, the seat of martyrs, he was upset that Arius is, uh, and, and Christ appeared to him in a dream. When he appeared to him in a dream, what did he, what did he see Christ doing? You guys know the story? He saw Christ came to him with a torn 
garment. So Saint, uh, Saint Peter, that was the patriarch at the time, he asked Christ, what happened to your garment? Who tore your garment? It's, it's Arius who is a tearing my garment with his false teaching. So here, see all the significance here, the, 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 the prophecy, and it was accurately fulfilled. And later on in history, we see Christ kind of confirming that when he appeared or when he came in a vision to St. Peter, the seal of martyrs, and telling him, he told him, Lord, we we'll never see you again with a torn garment. Allo, it's Arius who's tearing the church and uh, cutting the message of the gospel or the, uh, diver, uh, okay, perverting the gospel. Thirst, they put gall in my food, give me vinegar for my thirst. They offered Jesus wine to drink, mix it with gall, and after tasting it, he refused it to again. Uh, finally, I just want to come here. Oh, wow. Okay. So quickly, let's read it and try to get some message out of this. And this is my last uh, prophecy of the suffering of Christ. <laughs> okay. Okay, so let's, we're going to do it, uh, yani, we take a few verses, it's not a long chapter, but it's very, very deep. We see Isaiah, who lived, lived 800 years before Christ, and as if he was standing under the cross. Maybe all the evangelists wrote about Christ's trial, his being uh, scourged or flogged, uh, the trials, him, and then all they said about the cross, and they nailed him that's it or actually they never he never mentioned that they nailed him we don't know that christ was nailed to the cross and in none of the four evangelists talk about nails at all right how do we know that christ was nailed to the cross david. Hmm. sorry david, david? okay <laughs> the, the, okay yes you know you have the answer i saw you have the answer <laughs> Tuma? okay مسامير صح برافو عليك تاخد قربانة يا بونا دي تاخد حتة كبيرة دي يس يس بس بس it's not mentioned by the evangelist but yes historically yes it's true but when we talk about the Bible, the, the reference that Thomas said, I want to put my finger in the face of the nails. Okay. So also, what's very nice about the Old Testament, especially the book of Isaiah, the feelings of Christ, the Psalms. I want you, when we, when we say the, the Psalm in the, in the Pascha, the Psalm is usually the long hymn. that We sing it very slow. So a lot of times we... Yeah, and we start daydreaming and falling asleep and whatever. Try to read the words of the Psalms, the Psalm that is being sung. The Psalms, again, reflect the feelings of Christ. Okay, so again, David, Isaiah, all of them kind of give us how, what Christ felt. Like when we look at the four Gospels, the inner feelings of Christ, how he felt, we don't read, any, we don't get it in, 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 the, in the Gospels. Okay, so let's, let's, uh, Read if somebody can, يعني, two verses at a time and we can get a tick. Yeah, I'll show you. Okay. Your name? Megid. Go ahead, Megid. Okay, two very first two verses. Sorry. And to whom has the same alarm of the Lord been relayed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He has no from our complaints, and when we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Thank you, man. Okay, so here, who has believed our report? It has a connection from 52, but who has believed our report? Meaning, who can believe that the Son of God, the King of Kings, would who, who can believe that would happen to him? That he would leave all his glory and 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 to whom has the arm, arm of the Lord been revealed? This arm of the Lord means his incarnation, his deliverance, his redemption. Yani with all what Christ went through, some people still don't believe that he died for humanity. So here Isaiah starting, who has believed our report? that the Son of God, that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. 
for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. At that time, when he says the word dry ground, meaning lawlessness or sin was all over. And Christ being a perfect man, resembling perfect humanity, is like a tender plant. He shall grow up before him. He's talking about the father and the son. He shall grow before him as a tender plant with no fault, loving everybody in purity, and as a root out of dry ground. Dry ground meaning the, the state of sin. And, and, and we, we see the dry ground before Christ's crucifixion. Everybody's against him. The Romans and the Jews, and of course, was, was God's, yani, this, God arranged that to be that. So Christ is dying for all humanity. He was oppressed by the Jewish people. He was oppressed by the Romans. And they tried to find a fault Yani, when the Jewish people said, he is making him, himself the son of God. So the, for the Romans, like, he's the son of God. He go, yani, why would we crucify him? And they flipped it and said, but he wants, he, again, he's against Caesar. So they, they, again, they're trying to play it around just to get the Romans to be upset. And, the Jewish, and God allowed this to happen for the whole, pre, uh, all humanity to be, to oppress Christ. And he would die for the sin of all, all humanity. He shall grow up and as a root of dry land, he has no form of communist. Yani there is no form from the suffering. When you see Christ after he was flogged, it will, I'm not sure if you know, but anyone who would get receive a punishment, he would get flogged 40 times. And that will be sufficient. 40 times, this is a complete uh, punishment for Christ. But Christ was flogged 39 times. And they said, well, it's not complete. Now we can crucify him. If he would have received the last one, we did not allow it according to Roman law to crucify him. Now he's getting yani, two penalties kind of thing. So Christ bore all the suffering. You guys have seen the passion of Christ, I'm sure. How he was. So what Isaiah here, 800 years. You see, he has no form from all the suffering, all the pain. Isaiah, where were you? What, how did you see all this? Okay, that we see him. There is no beauty in him that we should desire him. He's despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. And again, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Again, any grief that human, anyone can go through, Christ went through. The word acquainted, he knows what we go through. And we had, as it were, our faces from him, he was despised and we did not esteem him. Why did he do all this? Why he was despised and rejected? Why were we accepted to be men of sorrows? Surely he has borne, it is for us. He has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And we yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. What does that verse mean? Yeah, and with the suffering that Christ went through, how he looked like before the cross, getting flogged and, and yani, imagine he, he could not carry the cross and he had to get help. Who helped him carry the cross? John, Simon of Cyrene, yes. So imagine from, from all the pain that Christ went through, he could not carry the cross, right? So what does it mean here? He has, of course, he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. What did this man do that God would allow all the sufferings to fall on him. Yani we, yani again, he's saying we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. And see Christ, again, out of his humility, accepted all the suffering for our sake. That people would look at someone and say, how can, what did this person do that God would allow this all to, to fall on him? Surely he has borne our griefs, carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. Oops. And the nice verse, who can uh, read the first two verses? Nakhba from this side here. Okay, guys. Tawanita, you're helping me. Part of the servant's team, Jan. Who can read for us? Any volunteers? Go ahead, Marina. Thank you. Sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. Go ahead, carry on. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he 
was oppressed and he was afflicted, he was opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Thank you, Marina. So again, very famous verse that we hear all the time. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. For us to be to have this inner peace to live with God, it was upon him. Why did he go through all the suffering? Just for us to be uh, to have our peace with God again it was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. And then he tells the story: We will like sheep have gone astray. God created man to live with him. But he, again, we, everyone, we, we gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Everybody going astray by his own way. And Christ carried the sin of humanity. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So Christ, on, in Gethsemane, the night before his cross, he saw the sins of the past, of the future as well. The sin that you're going to commit in the next few years, Christ carried on the cross. So that's why he said he saw in this cup the sin of the whole world. The sin of us all was laid on, laid on him. Okay, He has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. What does the word oppressed mean? The word oppressed. Oppressed, yani, what does the word oppressed? Persecuted, Persecuted okay. Persecution, it's zalam, yeah. it's unjustly, treated. unjustly treated, oppressed, unfairly. unfairly treated. The word oppressed, yani you were unfairly treated or zalamed. How, how easy it is when you feel you're oppressed and you don't open your mouth. Is it easy? When some, no, could look to the <laughs> right? But Christ, this was very hard on him. He was oppressed. He's the Holy One. He didn't know he became a sin for us and he had done nothing wrong. Imagine carrying the sin of us all on himself. He laid, uh, uh, as it says, the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. I had done nothing wrong. But you're carrying the sin of those who murder, those who commit adultery, those who do whatever. It's on you. So again, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, as a sheep before the shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Okay, somebody can read from this side now. Go ahead. Sorry. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who will declare the generation? For he was cut off from the land and the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. And they made his grave with wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Thank you. Okay, so what is he talking about here? Just want to focus here again, talking about the transgression of the people. But verse 9 is very unique. He says, And they meet his grave with the wicked. Meaning what? When they crucified Christ, they said, after we all of them die, we're going to take them and bury them eh, in these graves yani, for the wicked. Yani, the Romans, they, okay, when they execute someone, they say after they die, we're going to put them in this yani, tomb or whatever. But here, look at the accuracy of the prophecy here. They made his grave with the wicked. The plan was to eh, bury all three of them together. But here it says, but with the rich at his death. At the point when Christ died, some rich man came. His name was Joseph of Arimathea. So here the accuracy here, the plan was to put him with the wicked, to bury him like anyone else. But at the point of his death, we see he came and he asked for the body of Christ. So the question for you here, if Christ bore all these sufferings, and he, why did he kind of wanted to be buried on his, in his own tomb. So he could write his exactly. It could only be him that rose from Exactly. It is the point of the resurrection. So at his death, when he died, uh, again, with the rich meaning he would have his own tomb. Do you guys know the story? When Joseph of Arimathea went home and told his wife, I gave away our family tomb, and she got upset. You guys know the story? 
No? <laughs> it's a joke, okay. <laughs> Just making sure you're awake. So Zero of Arbathea went home and told his wife, I give away our family to him. He's like, what? Like, don't worry, he's renting it for the weekend. So <laughs> 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 okay, so here, he was with the rich, as his, because he had done no violence, no right, any deceit in his mouth. This is a very difficult verse. Yet, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Was, was the father really happy to see his son getting crucified? What do you guys think of verse 10? It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Was it a different word in Hebrew? I don't know Hebrew. We all want to know Hebrew. <laughs> what do you think? Was it the pleasure of God the Father? Okay, let me ask a different question. Was Christ pleased? Okay, so you, you might look at this verse. Yes. English version is really bad. The Arabic is better. He didn't really bruise him. We cannot bruise. We cannot. We cannot. The word. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. Ah, Muktaba A. So the 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 word is the same. So it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Is it because the alternative would have been that we all, as his children, die? Okay, and let me ask you, so when we talk about the Father here, how about Christ? Was Christ pleased to go on the cross? Was he joyful to go on the cross? We should say no. Okay, okay, okay. But Christ going to the cross, was he joyful or not joyful? Joyful. He was on a mission. Joyful or not joyful? Hmm. What do you think of when, when it was previous? Yes, no, and the chef, yes, and no. We, in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews, uh, it says, For the joy he had before him, he endured the cross. So, the joy of our Lord Jesus Christ going to redeem humanity, this was joyful for him. I want to read the verse for you. You guys know what verse I'm talking about? No? Who can open for me Hebrews 10? No, it's not 10. I think it's uh, Hebrews 12. And to nature's two wills. They have the, they had they had one will. There's no such thing as two wills, sorry. You have to go fast. It will lead us to the scouting. No, not the reading. No. Can you twelve two? Who can read Hebrews twelve two? So when will? So the God, the Son here, the joy set before him. So he, he again, yes, he, he, he suffered, but it pleased him to save humanity. And he said, for this hour I have come. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grieve. When you make his soul an offering for sin, an offering for sin, the worst kind of sacrifice, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his life. Finally, I want to finish up with this. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. Who is the labor of the suffering of Christ? He shall, shall, shall see the labor of what he went through, and he shall be satisfied. Us. Us. This, is a, this is his labor. The church of the New Testament. The church of the New Testament. And from the point that Christ died on the cross, one of the fathers says something really nice. They say when Adam, when the first Adam, when first Adam slept, his wife was taken from his side, Eve. Right? God took her. And, and they say when the second Adam slept on the cross, his wife, his bride, was taken from his side. What was the again? When pierced Christ, what came out? Water and blood. And this is the foundation of the church, the, the baptism and the Eucharist. So the church is born from the side of Christ. So the second Adam, meaning our Lord Jesus Christ, when he slept on the cross, meaning he, he, he died on the cross, his, his bride, uh, uh, being us, was taken from inside the church through the, the, the water and the blood. He, he shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify Many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul unto death. And again, 
He poured out his soul out of his own will. Christ offered himself willingly. And he, no one offered Christ, but he offered himself. He is the priest and he is the sacrifice, right? Any sacrifice would require a priest to offer it, right? Any sacrifice would require a priest to offer the sacrifice. So who, who, who sacrificed Christ? Himself. That's why Christ, when he died on the cross, he was in a position of offering a sacrifice. He's lifting his hand, offering a sacrifice. Okay, so Christ offering himself, he is the priest and he is the sacrifice, stretching his hand, saying, I'm offering myself uh, to the, uh, to, uh, on behalf of the sin of the world. And he was numbered with the transgressions and he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressions. So again, it's a very deep chapter, Isaiah 53. Read it and uh, we just give, give you a kind of few kind of comments on it. Uh, I urge you to get the fathers what they say about it, and it's a very, very good chapter to kind of reflect on the passion of our Savior. We, we wish you a blessed Passion Week at the foot of the cross, and may God bless you all, and uh, may all rejoice in the glory of his holy resurrection, and to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.